Um, my lab has undergone many changes since we started collaborating. And the most obvious of those changes is now my lab is almost an all-woman lab. <laughs> so we are having to bring in gentlemen from outside, such as Professor Flip Phillips, <laughs> to restore some sense of balance. Um, so Margaret is a through and through Bostonian. She grew up here. She did her graduate work at Northeastern and her postdoctoral work with Professor Helen Tager Flusberg at the Sh Shriver Center. Um, and Helen is now, of course, at, at BU. After her postdoctoral work, uh, Margaret um, also got clinical certification. Is that an accurate way to describe it? Um, and then, of course, she has continued pursuing uh, basic scientific research. So for a condition as complex as autism, we'd like to be able to draw upon many domains of expertise, of wisdom. So we'd like to, to tap into the, the wisdom of parents of children with autism, clinicians who see many children touched by the condition, and also basic researchers. And Margaret is one of those rare few individuals who merges all of these domains of expertise. <clears throat> so Margaret is the mother of a child uh, with autism. She, as I said, has a, a tremendous amount of experience in the clinic, and she's a wonderful scientist. So I'm delighted, Margaret, that you have chosen to, to work with us, and I can't wait to hear your talk. Thank you. Thank you Pavan. Um, can you hear me, first of all? I'm a low talker, and I want to be sure that I'm projecting enough. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk today about um, some empirical support for a hypothesis that's been developed in the Sinha lab. Um, and I want to introduce you to the lab. So um, the embodied and disembodied people are the members of the group who have done all the heavy lifting on this project. So it, in the way that it truly takes a village to raise a child, it truly takes a village to test a theory. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge everybody who's been doing so much work on, on behalf of this project um, because everyone has, has really put in um, a great deal of, of effort and work and time and passion. So. Um, Everything that I will be talking about is a truly collaborative um, effort. But I wanted to start out, before I talk about the data, about how I landed up with such a fabulous group of people. And the way that happened was, as Pavan said, I was doing postdoctoral work with Helen Tager Flussberg in, in the 90s. And the work that I was doing was looking at high-level psycholinguistic kinds of processes in autism. So I did that for about nine years. And I still collaborate with Helen, and I still look at those kinds of issues. But um, in 19, no, which that's my oldest son, in the year 2005, I had a son who was born. And then I had a daughter two years later. And on his second birthday, practically, um, that day, it seems, he regressed significantly. So he had what seemed to be relatively intact language skills. He had a lot of social communication things like pointing, all these pre-linguistic things that you look for in typically developing kids. And since I had been studying autism for nine years at the point at that point in time, um, I wasn't concerned until um, this regression occurred. And if I had been of sort of the Jenny McCarthy way of thinking about causality, I might have said having a baby causes autism, um, because it was that striking to me. But instead, I went to um, have him diagnosed. And, um, and just one thing that you should know, that, that getting a diagnosis, even in the Boston area, can be quite difficult. So there was a year waiting list at the time for him to get an appointment. And, and because I knew about research, I knew that if I could get him into a study, I could get a diagnosis that way. So I got a, he was able to get diagnosed before the age of three. So he was diagnosed relatively quickly after my daughter was born. So um, here's my son, Walter. He's a beautiful, loving, funny, brave, um, and autistic. 
and, he ha and he's autistic. He is um, a very complex so set of features that are associated with his diagnosis, and I want to sort of walk you through a little bit of that. Um, so Walter has a lot of fun with his family, um, with his sister and brother and with me, but he does spend a lot of time alone, and he's not really interested in peers very much. So uh, what we would call this would be a social disorder. And I put quotes around this because I feel like um, the word disorder is a little bit harsh. I just feel like, uh, I feel more like it's differences at this point in time, but, um, but the word, the appropriate clinical word to use is disorder. He experiences the sensory world so very differently from his siblings. Um, and so this would be his sensory disorder. So what you see on the, on the left is the bed of nails at the Museum of Science. I was really surprised that he even got on it after, but his sister got on and she had fun with it. But you can see that he's not having so much fun having the, the nails come up and touch his back. So he's having some tactile sensation that's different. Um, he loves the water. He loves to go swimming. He loves to be in the, in the ocean and in the, in a warm pool in Bermuda. But he also likes to go into the ocean in the wintertime um, on Plum Island, which if, if you've been there in the summer, the water's really cold. It's like that kind of cold that your feet hurt when you start to go in. But he has no problem in the winter going in this water. Um, and then that's all sort of centered around the fact that he has a very salient um, a hypersensitivity to sounds. So you can see that while other children are having fun playing and two of those children are the adorable children of one of our audience members um, with my daughter. So they're having a blast playing on the giraffe at Legoland, but Walter's um, experiencing something quite different. So, so this is what a sensory disorder is, is like. Um, now, even though he, he uh, experiences uh, sounds in a very unpleasant way or a different way from the way we do, um, he also makes a lot of noise. And I just wanted to play for you an example of me just putting him to bed at night so you can hear what it sounds like, the kinds of sounds that he would make. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> nope. And nope, nope. There. It's not playing over there. So those noises, so you heard a little bit. I knew there was one more. <laughs> so, so, I, so this is one of the salient things that it, when you hear parents talk about having a child with autism, they're like, oh, the noise, you know, the incessant noise. Um, that we don't really, um, I don't really know of anybody studying this, and it's an area that I'm sort of interested in. So there's the echolalia piece of his um, language, but then there are these, it's not speech, it's, it's speech sounds, but it's just this repetitive, very loud, um, noise-making behavior that, uh, that we live with. So all of my kids, of course, love Chinese food, and that's influenced very heavily by Walter's love of baking dumplings. Um, but for Walter, there's also other foods that are very aversive. Um, so he can, you know, he, he loves to eat the rice and noodles and everything with a, that's everything that um, is uh, really bad for you in Chinese food as well, like all the fried stuff. But when he like even thinks about eating a banana, he can vomit at the thought of that. Or if you presented him with yogurt, he would, he would have a very strong negative response to that as well. And he hasn't had a glass of milk since he was two years old. He just will not and refuses to drink milk. Um, he also has pica. So you see that little plastic thing that's down in the left can corner. That is a, um, a little plastic hand that, um, that, is a, that is a toy, and he ate all the fingers off the hand. So, he has plastic animals, he'll eat the ears off of those, and he'll eat the, the um, tails off of the animals. He also will eat um, very many other things that you wouldn't expect the child to eat. So, um, so that's a, a problem. And my, my son also needs to have things spelled out for him visually. So 
So the behaviors that I've been describing to you, what I do, what we all do, because this is very many uh, contributors to the, uh, to the artwork here. So if there's a behavior of the day that's making us crazy, what we do is we write down, usually no, <laughs> no, and then we put an X through the thing and stick it up on the wall of rules. And later we'll say, go to the wall, and he points to the right one, and then he stops the behavior. So it helps him parse the, the auditory world. And I think this is, this is part of his language disorder, so his comprehension of auditory language is difficult. So he needs to have something static in front of him that he can use to parse. He, um, he plays with his toys by lining them up, and um, this would fall into the restricted interest repetitive behaviors or disordered play. And he also listens to Smash Mouth songs repeatedly, um, so at least he has good taste there. Um, he also has difficulty riding bikes and playing tennis, soccer, and catch. So what we do is modify. So his sister can ride a bike, but he rides a scooter. Um, we also um, have elliptigos, which, are, um, which don't involve pedals. And he, his, he rode a, um, a balance bike when he was smaller, so they don't make them for big kids. But that's a bike that doesn't have pedals. And I think that the, the action of the pedals was just too difficult for him to negotiate with, um, with the bike. But, um, so we just have to, to modify for him to be able to play outdoors. All right, so why am I telling you about my son? <laughs> um, as a mom, I find myself, um, so I was you know, doing this research in psycholinguistic kinds of theories of, of autism, and then I, I have this, this child whose world is just so incredibly difficult. You know, I, I did remember a, a very salient moment when I was at one of his many appointments and they gave me a quality of life checklist and it was like, you know, how many family parties do you miss because of your child? And, and, and I started to go through that, and it really hit home. I was like, you know, our lives have been affected pretty drastically by, by why things are so difficult for Walter. And it's, it's mainly the sensory thing that, that, uh, that prohibits a lot of uh, participation in our, in our activities. So um, as a scientist then, it naturally followed that I would change the focus of my research to something that I was passionate about, which is figuring out why the world is so, so difficult for, for kids like my son. So the, the other population that I had been studying was sort of the higher functioning end of the population of autism, the, the individuals who are able to go and be scanned or who are able to follow directions and participate in research that way. And then likewise, as a, as a teacher in the clinic and in my courses on autism, um, I changed the focus that, there as well. I, you know, I started to get more interested in, you know, these the what's underlying this this really difficult world for uh, for Walter. Um, now, last year in this forum, Professor Sinha presented the magical world of autism, and that w was a paper that was published last year, autism as a disorder of prediction. So the paper was published. Um, and it went through what, OK, this is I wanted to mention. Um, so one of the people that you saw on that first slide, Tapan Gandhi, was my roommate for a couple of months because he was between uh, jobs. And he did a lot of cooking. <laughs> and I freely admit that I gained 10 pounds with his help. Um, but what he taught me about was masala, right? So if you think of a masala, it's like all these ingredients that sort of blend together nicely and well and, and make a nice. Uh, Corey. But when you think about autism and the things that I described with my son, it's like, it's like a bad masala. It's like taking tarragon and turmeric and sticking them together. They don't, it doesn't work. So it seems like what autism is is a sort of laundry list of unrelated behaviors. And so what, um, what this paper did was say, OK, let's take all these apparently disparate behaviors um, like insistence on sameness and, and language and communication disorders and um, and sensory sensitivities, and see if there's something common that we can use to model um, that might underlie what are seen, what these behaviors are. So all clinicians have to go on, and all parents have to go on, is what the, what the outcomes are, like these these behaviors that are out there, and um, and just sort of describe them literally as separate entities. But if you model in terms of um, predictive abilities, it seems like you can explain most of these different behaviors with one kind of a um, model. So that's the magical world hat. <laughs> so basically, the computational task is to 
observe the world and given the, and re recognize the probability of B given that A has occurred over time. So as I said, that this could expand, at the paper we go into what that means with regard to insistence on sameness, sensitivities, difficulty with dynamic objects, and difficulty with theory of mind, and these are all things that we see in my son, right? So um, this predictive impairment in hypothesis is also accompanied by what I think is a really helpful way to sort of conceptualize um, the, the phenotype and how there's so much variability in the phenotype and all these different kinds of behaviors that we're talking about. So the orange world is where things are undetectable. The probabilities are, are too, um, are too uh, low and the, and the time is too stretched. So um, if you think about things like phonotactics, um, that would be something where it's happening quick in time and maybe the probabilities are okay. So that is sort of detectable. And what the shift, I wanted to just mention that the, the function, which is sort of modeled after the con contrast sensitivity function, because we have a vision scientist at our, as our PI, um, that, um, that he, what the idea is, is that the, the typical, the neurotypical curve is sort of shifted out so that the things that would normally be detectable become undetectable. And so that's where people with autism live, in this world where things are not detectable and it's, and it's, um, it's as if things are happening by, uh, by magic. So, so phonotactics, we could put sort of at, at this point on the, on the graph, just to give you some concrete examples. Maybe ball catching is more in this area. Um, and then social conventions sort of happen way over, over a course of longer durations of time. And then um, understanding your significant other is never, ever going to make it in there, right? That's like completely undetectable. So a major influence into developing the theory came from the fact that children and adults with autism have uh, sensory hypersensitivities. So about 90% of children with autism are affected and hence sensitivity to auditory stimuli is the most common um, form of this. And while some had argued that hypersensitivities were the result of hyperacute sensation, um, these findings were disputed by later researchers. So if, um, so from where do hypersensitivities in, in ASD come? So um, if you reverse the question from why are those with ASD hypersensitive <clears throat> to why are neurotypicals not hypersensitive, then you can start to understand what's going on a little bit. And I have to point out that this slide is like fantasy land. Um, I don't know of any woman who's ever been able to sit and read a book while her man is vacuuming around her. Um, so I don't know where Pavan got that slide. Um, but, so the question is neurotypicals are not hypersensitive and that's due to habituation. And this has been measured behaviorally and in, in the brain. So if we think about now hypersensitivities in autism as a function of impaired habituation, um, it, it, there, there's a, a story to tell. So per, habituation is sort of at its, at its core a, a predictive task. So one thing that we've done is um, use GSR to measure habituation and one of our lab members is being hooked up to um, actually a full-blown lie detecting gear. Um, so one fun thing about the lab meetings is that we've been inviting experts from all sorts of domains to sort of inform our methods as well as to inform the theory and how we're testing the methods. So who you see here is uh, Jack Consigli and he's an expert in lie detection. So he's hooking up Annie, who clearly looks like she thinks she's going to trick the lie detecting um, gear. Um, but it, this was a, a fun day to have him come and, sh and teach us more about how you measure these peripheral kinds of measures of, of, um, of you know, ex excitation. Oh, what was it? I forget. I wasn't there for the question. What was the question of? <laughs> is what is eight times four plus? <laughs> 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 I can really. <laughs> I can totally. I totally feel your pain. <laughs> so, um, so in the in the experiment, we used metronomic beeps presented to participants over speakers 
the hertz, uh, it was a 250 hertz tone, there was a one second interstimulus interval, and there were 300 tone bur bursts over five minutes, and just measuring GSR on fingertips. There were um, participants from India as well as participants from the US, so um, it's nice to have um, converging results from two different um, environments and two different kinds of uh, setups. And as would be expected, the GSR trace for a neurotypical shows habituation, so it decreases over time. Um, so this is an example from one subject, and then we have a couple of others to sort of show you that it's, it's not just that one particular subject who showed that pattern. Um, whereas for the ASD subjects, um, you see something that looks quite different. So instead of having that slope that was going down over time, what you see is a skin conductance response that's increasing um, and not showing evidence of habituation. And here's a couple of other subjects as well. And we've, uh, we've worked really hard to, to look at individuals across the spectrum as far as functioning level goes, as well as across the age range. So the age range here, I think, is, I thought it was on there. Um, it's from about 7 to about 22. Um, and what the top graph shows you is the blue line and the red line are the, the average, average slopes that are normalized um, over time. So the neurotypical blue, you can see that that's the average, and then the variance around it is the light blue. Um, and then and you see a, a, a slope that's going down, clearly. And, evidence of habituation. Whereas for the ASD subjects, you don't see that. You see sort of a flat and slightly rising um, mean and more variability, of course. And then the, the plots below show you the, um, the GSR slope for the ASDs in red again and the neurotypicals in blue. And you can see that the patterns are flipped pretty much. The ASD pat slopes are going up and the neurotypical slopes are going down. So the summary to the GSR um, experiment to metronomic tones, when neurotypicals showed the expected decline in response over time, and ASDs did not show such a decline, the lack of habituation is consistent with a lack of predictability, um, predictive abilities, and an inability to perceive that a metronomic tone sequence is unchanging would lead to the experience of each tone being like a new event. Yep. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So they're just passively, they're, they're hooked up to the GSR, they sit in a room, and it's over speakers. Um, it's presented over loudspeakers. How did you see the time slope? Was that seconds? It was um, three, five minutes, I think, of five. duration. Five minutes. Um, I just have some data in there. Okay. So. Given the findings that we had in the peripheral nervous system, we wanted to corroborate that with neural responses and perform the same experiment, same stimuli, but this time used MEG measurements. Um, but, yep. Um, we know that it's the predictability of the tone that leads to the different GSR. Um, I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I get your question. If, so, if, if is the tone, okay, the metronome, if I, I probably missed something, but if the metronome is always predictable in your case, yes, um, that would produce those curves, but we don't know that it's the predictability per se that's doing it. Have you tested unpredictable uh, metron, you know, random metronomes? Or well, we're, we've done some, we're doing some mismatch negativity stuff as, as well. Um, so. But we haven't, I don't think we've done any non-metronomic non sequences at this point. But that's one, so not from our lab, but from other labs, there's this, uh, so if you have an unpredictable tone sequence, that essentially abolishes habituation in neurotypicals. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't done that here, but there seems to be consistent evidence that the predictability of a sequence is very proportional to the amount of habituation you would observe in neurotypicals. But uh, what you're pointing out would be very interesting to do. So if we were to have unpredictable tone sequences, then we would expect to see the same behavior in ASDs, but a different behavior in neurotypicals. Um, 
Okay, so uh, same experiment in the MAG. And so that represents each tone being um, produced and then the, the um, signal as a result of the tone. And this is what the signal might look like. And then what we do is average over the first 50 beeps and the final 50 beeps. Um, and then overlay them and operationalize habituation as the difference in the amplitude of the signal. So the red signal here being uh, reduced indicates habituation to the tones. So is the latency shorter or you just offset it for the visual presentation? The, the meetup data. Yeah. It's meetup data. Yeah. <laughs> So um, here's examples of real data. Um, so for uh, neurotypical subjects, you can see evidence of this reduced amplitude, um, indicating that they are habituating to the tones in the MEG. <clears throat> for the ASD subjects, there's a lot more you know, variability again, but you see the opposite response, that there's an increased amplitude for the last 50 tones. And then normalizing and averaging over um, 12 age-matched pairs, so 24 subjects total, you can see that um, in the neurotypical, oh, my, I'm doing that with my arrow, sorry. Um, in the neurotypical slide, you see evidence of habituation, where the first 50 trials have a peak much larger than the last 50 trials, and for the ASDs, you see the opposite pattern. Um, and again, if we plot the slopes this way, normalize first and last 50, you can see that the pattern flips for the ASDs. So the first 50 trials are larger, have a larger response than the last 50 trials in the neurotypicals, and then for the ASDs, the first 50 um, have a uh, reduced compared to the last 50 trials. And again, this is a, across the age span and functioning level. <clears throat> so to summarize the habituation to tones, what we have are ASD participants um, at, at various levels um, in both peripheral and various, various levels of functioning show both peripheral and central habituation to tones. And why is this cool? Um, it's easy. It's, it's cool because, A, it's easy to use for experimental purposes. So you can actually test across the, the spectrum of, of uh, autism. And then also, the application to diagnostics for young children at risk for ASD uh, is, is a quite exciting idea to think about. If, if GSR could be used and we could measure habituation or pro profiles of habituation that were different, it might, be, it might influence the way we are able to diagnose um, young kids. Okay, so, yeah. Really straightforward way to find out if they. I, I don't think we've done that to date. Have we ever asked them? No. No. Not so far. Um, so now I want to ask the question about more real kinds of stimulation. So. In the environment, we habituate to all kinds of stimuli. We're, we're not often listening to metronomic tone sequences. There are, are lots of other things in the world that we have to habituate to. So um, we, want to we want to look at prediction vis-a-vis -vis habituation to auditory as well as visual stimuli, and um, not just prediction vis-a-vis -vis habituation, but also the anticipatory elements of prediction. So the next experiment involves habituation to videos. And we wanted to show next whether neurotypicals and ASDs and subjects with autism would show differences in habituation to video presentations in which there is an event that's meant to be exciting. Um, so this is closer to something that might be more of a more naturalistic process. And it's also passive and allows for um, us to test across the autism spectrum. And uh, the exciting thing, uh, so Pavan has some pilot data using horror movies that shows that GSR tra tra traces um, in, are a good way to measure anticipation of a gory event in the horror movie after you repeat the presentation of it. So once you've seen the movie and then you see it again and you know something really gross is going to happen, then you have a, a, an amplitude increase. So 
that's that's why we chose the stimuli that we did, not to be gory and horrifying, but <laughs> to have some sort of an event that would increase the response. So the the design is basically that there's a, a baseline of one minute of of relaxation and watching a video of just fish in an aquarium. So there's no exciting event. It's passive. And we're measuring GSR again. <clears throat> and then there are five presentations of the same video clip, which is 30 seconds long. And then there's a blank screen um, or a black screen in between for 10 seconds. So it looks something like this, if you can see that. So there's the, what the fish tank might look like for a minute. And then five clips representing what video clip we had. So it, the, um, the video clips are a couple of cartoons and then a couple of um, real people. <laughs> um, we're hoping to sort of engage the children with the, the cartoons for the younger kids. So I just want to show you one of them so you can understand what I mean by an exciting event. Um, and the audio didn't work the last time, so I hope you can hear this. Hmm. Sorry, I'm getting beyond myself here. This is my favorite video of the ones that we have. <laughs> so, um, so you can see that there's this unexpected thing that happens, and we're expecting a, an increase in the GSR response. This is what the setup looks like. This is Annie's lovely hand, <laughs> and uh, and the new log device that we're using. Here's a child you may recognize by now, watching repeated presentations and connected to the GSR. And the the towel is just sort of to keep him from um, interfering with the collection of data. Right now we have um, 12 ASDs and 18 neurotypicals. The mean age is 14 and 11.6, uh, and the age range is from 6.5 to 19 um, years old. A sample neurotypical trace looks like this. So you see the first, you see the baseline to the fish, and then you see the presentation one, two, three, four, and five, and you see a different line for each one of the videos. Um, what you can see over the course of this is a, a decline over the course of the five videos, and um, we're, we're using that as evidence of habituation. Um, one thing I want to say that is we're looking at habituation to these videos. We're, we're kind of working against ourselves by the nature of the videos. So. Um, we're making it harder to find habituation given that we have these exciting events within these plots. So it's not as if it's just a one boring, um, you know, a boring video that has nothing exciting happening. We're expecting that there should be a spike in the middle of the video, and we want to look at the anticipatory. Um, we want to look at anticipatory shifts as as the presentations repeat over time. But we're still in the you know early stages of data analysis and haven't had time to do that yet. But um, here's an example for an ASD trace with the same, um, for the same layout. So you see the fish baseline, presentation one, two, three, four, and five. And again, what you see is it, what appears to be something like an increase in response over the five presentations of the video. And when we average, um, again, this is an average like the other um, GSR data that you saw. So the, the blue line here is the average slope. And then the variability around that is the light blue. And for the neurotypicals, it's look, it looks as if there's, especially when you look at presentation five, a decrease in, um, in response. And for the ASDs, you do not see that same decrease. When we were able to pull four age match participants out, um, you can see that um, the ASD slopes are going up and the neurotypical slopes are, for the most part, going down. And this was a significant difference between the two groups <clears throat> when we did a t-test. 
And then if you average slopes for the five videos, you can also see the same pattern. So this is video one, two, three, four, and five, not age match pattern um, participants, but sort of collapsing over the group. And you can see that the ASD slopes are going up and the neurotypicals are going down. And then there's some variability among the videos. So to summarize the um, predictive abilities in repeated video, video presentation, we, s we have some evidence of habituation in the neurotypicals and evidence of impaired habituation for repeated, vid repeated video sequences in ASD. And then, as I had mentioned, the future analyses will include looking at those anticipatory spikes within the presentations over time. <clears throat> okay, so another segue. Um, now recall the idea that um, the autism phenotype is a seemingly long list of disparate unrelated symptoms. So we're going to go in a completely different direction now and the next set of experiments looks at interaction with dynamic objects. And this is a, a really big problem for individuals with autism. So in navigating traffic, two out of three parents of kids who elope um, have a, had a, a close call with a traffic injury. And I have personally experienced this myself. So um, I, I, where my son and I and my daughter and my other son, we all moved to Arlington from the middle of the woods. And so my son's not used to traffic and Mass Ave and, and that kind of thing. And we were coming out of a pizza place. And his insistence on sameness meant that he had to go to the door that's always his door. And it was street side. And so he flew around the car to go to his door, not understanding that the car is coming up to take a right-hand turn. We're going to directly, you know, the trajectory was pretty clear to me and it scared me a lot. And so I can remember when he was young and he was an eloper that I, I would hold on to his hand so tight <laughs> because especially in parking lots, it was just really a nightmare. And I, I couldn't physically go to the grocery store with my two kids when they were younger because he was an eloper and I had to hold her. So it was just too much juggling. Um, so I had to have a friend or a babysitter come with me to the grocery store um, because of this issue. And then ball catching, um, there's a quote here that throwing a ball was not a problem, but this person couldn't catch a ball until he was 13. And so um, why is that? If, and now let's go back to um, predictive abilities. And the idea is that tracking an object requires predicting where the object is going to be over time. So predicting position A given B or B given A over time. And then you end up with where the ball is going to land. So um, so we're doing ball catching, and um, the method is basically we're varying the location of the tosses to the children, we're, and even though ball catching may sound like a really low-tech kind of experiment to do, it's naturalistic, it's real world, but given that we're in the Sinha lab, we can use computer vision techniques for tracing the videos that we're taking of the ball and the hands, looking at the trajectories of both over time, the ball and the hand, and analyzing the speed of the motion of both. And what we're hoping to do is to come up with some good metrics for operationalizing predictive motion and movement. Um, so here's an example of how the, um, the throws were, uh, were decided. So, so there's a systematic 24 throws to the child, and there's this is a schematic of the um, the sphere around the child and where our thrower is supposed to aim for. Um, so some of the balls will go directly to the individual, and we didn't want to make it so easy that everybody could catch the balls. We wanted to make it so that you had to stress the predictive system. So we have some balls that are a little bit out of reach, some that are um, forward, some that are um, high, some that are low. Um, and then uh, this is a PowerPoint problem, but um, I should load my video. So this is a ball toss for a nine-year-old neurotypical child. And it looks like this ball is going to the left end. Um, here is the trace for this catch of the ball. And then here is the trace of the hands for the catch. And so what we're doing is plotting these traces like this. So this is the same throw. Um, and I have to say that, um, that the young people in the lab have been doing a ton of heavy lifting on these traces and on analyzing these data. Um, because there are 
a, t a ton of data and a lot of work to do. So what you see in the color coding here is the, um, the ball is the, the, the trajectory on the left. And the dark blue corresponds to time. So, I mean, and the color corresponds to time. So time is when, I'm, I'm hoping this is the, the moment of release <laughs> of the ball. And then the red is when the catch happens. And then that's taken and converted into a speed plot using um, some other data. Um, and what you see here is what we think looks like something like an anticipatory movement of the hands, where the hands are, get, are moving quickly prior to the ball arriving to the body. Um, and then I want to contrast this to an ASD throw, uh, also a nine-year-old. I'll show you that again. OK, so the trajectories for this, there's not much action in the hands, as you can see. Um, but the, there's the ball um, trajectory. And then the speed plot for this toss looks like this. And what you can see is that the hands aren't doing a whole lot until the ball is not moving any longer. So that's, um, it's, and also there's what appears to us to be something like a ballistic inc you know, movement. So his hands move quickly. When, when the ball's there, um, without that anticipatory in, increase in movement. Yeah? Sorry, are people who are talking about to the children in terms of their diagnosis? No. Okay. I think that would be impossible to do. Well, I guess we could have a blind thrower. Yeah. They are machines. Uh, yes, the, the machine people can be blind. Have to <laughs> right. People have suggested that we use automatic throwers that can introduce some amount of variability in where they're throwing the ball. That would, of course, be blind to the yeah. diagnosis. <laughs> yeah? Do we know how a child reacts to the ball in the space when the ball is flying in space? Is it possible that a child with ASD is just uh, not tracking the ball uh, very coherently? It's not only the motion planning deficit, but also the, like the visual perception. Yeah, yeah. We're really interested in trying to figure a way to get eye tracking kinds of data to cor corroborate with this, with these data as well. Um, so this is sort of um, our earliest attempt at, at trying to characterize that. But that would be a great thing to add. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of knowing whether this might be part of a, part, partly a motivational thing? I mean, are they just not as motivated to catch the ball as the neurotypicals? How how could one? I don't know how we would uh, yeah, I don't know titrate either. that out. Um, they seem to be having fun. <laughs> I, I can't really say. It, but it's um, what I like about the the experiment is that it's really like real world and naturalistic. You know, um, so. Um, yeah, it, it could, there's so many factors that could contribute to what they're doing, and it would be great to be able to tease them all out. But at this point in time, um, I don't think we can. Um, um, so, so, so summary of the ball catching data shows that um, the accuracy is slightly better in the neurotypicals relative to the ASD. And then preliminary evidence based on our plots that the neurotypical children are appearing to show some sort of anticipatory acceleration but the ASD children are showing a little anticipatory acceleration. Um, but there's much work to be done on this uh, front. So the overall summary um, would be that the initial tests of the theory of predictive impairment in autism are finding some support. Um, firstly, we found that there's some impaired habituation that indicates impaired predictive abilities to tones and then also to repeated video presentations. So I just put in those pictures to remind you that, you know, my son Walter has these um, sensory aversions to sounds. Um, and he also likes to listen to Smash Mouth repeatedly. So it might be th these may be um, outcomes of having some impaired predictive abilities. Um, <clears throat> as well, the ball catching data indicate that there may be a lack of anticipatory motion consistent with impaired predictive abilities. So, um, 
This would indicate a difficulty in predicting the trajectory of a ball as it approaches, which is consistent with the observations and reports of parents and the individuals who have autism and um, regarding their ball play and uh, avoiding traffic. And it may ex explain why my son has a difficulty time with sports and, um, and moving objects and cars. Um, and this is exciting progress to us because um, among the myriad of features of autism, we've tested two areas that seem quite unrelated on the surface um, when you think about sensory habituation and ball catching. You know, they seem like two of those things that don't really go together, but they're both features of autism. And we're saying that, they're, that the differences that we're seeing between the ASDs and the neurotypicals are, we think, due to predictive impairment. Um, and we're, we're excited about the findings that we have. And then there are very significant implications for how we conceptualize autism if we start thinking about predictive abilities. So instead of treating what, are, what we're thinking of as the outcome behaviors of having a predictive impairment and sort of thinking about prediction itself as the underlying feature, you know, that's, that's an important thing to, to think about for, for therapies and for diagnosis. And as well as that, um, I think that I have this personal political agenda to make the world a better place for people living with autism. And if we know that people with autism have predictive difficulties, we could really change the environment in which they live to sort of make it easier to, to function. So I think that that's something to think about. Um, and then I just wanted to say thank you to the MIT Simon Center for the Social Brain, Simon Safari. Um, Doctors Nelson and Rappaport, the League School, the BB School, Newburyport YWCA, Walter, and the many families who are willing to participate. Yes. Hold on. <laughs> well, I just want to get your personal take on mm -hmm. the experimental result. So, the habituation result could be because of a predictive impairment. It could not be. It may be something completely unrelated. Um, we hope, just as theoreticians, that uh, it's, it's related to the theory. But even if it's not, even if it doesn't have anything to do with predictive abilities, how could that finding of reduced habituation impact, say, uh, services or interventions for autism? Well. Absolutely, like you could, knowing that, that the world is a, a, such a sensory aversive place, you could do um, things like the acoustics in schools could be drastically changed. The acoustics right now in the, in the school that my son goes to are horrible. So there's, there was a, an, and this is mom talking again, um, but there were, the teachers um, told me one day that there was another boy with very, he's, sometimes they wear headphones at school because it's so bad. So there's another little boy who has the same sort of auditory hypersensitivity and my son in the hallway. And my son yells at this kid, too loud. And then the other kid yells back at him, too loud. And then they start to escalate. And they're yelling at one another and, and, um, and making themselves miserable at the same time, not really understanding that that's what they were doing. But so I think about that. And I, I had visited the Beverly School for the Deaf. And they, because of the cochlear implant kids, um, that environment is so nice and quiet. And I was just struck when I was in that building by how pleasant it was acoustically to, to, to be in that cafeteria. I was like, who would have thought that, that it, would, it would be such a drastic, um, make such a drastic change in, in your experience of a school. So that kind of a thing, uh, I think, easily. Is that the answer to your question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, um, so it looked like in the graphs that you showed that you, you in fact didn't just get lack of habituation in the ASD children, but in fact sort of like a sensitization, and, uh, you know, net increase. And I was just curious if you could comment on how consistent that finding was. Um, you know, was it, you know, just not, uh, not habituation or was it consistently sort of an increase across the children you looked at, looked like it was, but, and then uh, how you make sense of that. I think that um, we're saying that it's a lack of habituation, but if you look at the slopes, um, the, the bar graph of the slopes, um, uh, get there. So this is for the, um, 
the videos. It's, yeah, it's, it's that there's, oh, you want the, the one over time. Sorry, <laughs> getting there. Okay, yeah, it's um, it's a reduced response compared to the neurotypical habituation. You can see that the amplitude is is, um, is smaller, so that's why we're saying a lack of response. And it does seem to be a subtle response, a uh, subtle increase. And I can't remember the stats on that. Yeah, the, the variability amongst the ASD is sufficiently okay. high that it doesn't allow us to say. So all that we can say is that there's a reduction in habituation, but we can't say sensitization. Thank you. Is there any correlation, or have you been able to look to ask whether there is any correlation between the magnitude of the effect and the severity of their cognitive That's symptoms? definitely something we're going to be doing um, in the future. So now we're, um, we're adding a, a battery of psychometrics to start to correlate. Um, right those kinds of behaviors with, yeah. the, with the response. Yeah. yeah. And if you were to go on beyond 300 seconds, I mean, does the effect, do they continue to habituate more than neuro neurotypicals, or does it asymptote yeah. out? I mean, would you? We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, uh, it's hard to um, get the kids to sit for that long. Yeah, I guess. Um, sorry. What's the frequency of the metronome? Uh, 250 hertz. The tone, but the 250 milliseconds. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, no, I was asking the beat. One yeah, hertz. the pulse. One hertz. If you did it yeah. at um, two hertz, would you get twice as much data for the same amount of time? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. Yes, John. Quick hit. If you play a single <coughs> loud tone, measure a single initial GSR, is that equivalent in the two groups? Uh, a single loud tone is yeah, the, it, 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 How much, you know, if you measure, yeah, we see the learning curve over time. If yeah. sing, you make a single, you know, fairly loud uh, uh, sound, is that first GSR to a first? It seems tone? like the, the individuals with autism have a reduced response to start with. Um, Compared to the neurotypicals, but I don't know about a loud tone. I just wondering whether the traditional sensory, you know, GSR response is equivalent. Yeah. So, um, so they they do start out lower. It seems. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, when you originally put up the graph, where you suggested that maybe there would be a sort of a shift in the types of relationships that autistic kids would be able to predict, given the um, the deterministic relationship between the, the stimuli and, and the distance and time between cause and effect, right? It sort of seemed like you were arguing that um, their predictive ability might work in the same way, but just be reduced. But a lot of the data that you've shown us, um, even for cases like this metronome, which I would have thought would have been way up in the upper corner in terms of short distance and time between the events that are predicting one another and super high predictability, which maybe should still have been within the sort of capacities, we're seeing sort of not just quantitatively different or slower habituation, but just sort of entirely different pattern. And I wonder, um, how do you fit that into the idea of sort of reduced predictive ability? Do you think, this, and I think this is sort of what some of the other questions have been getting at, you know, in terms of asking if you went on farther in time, would you eventually see some habituation curve? Or is it the case that even if you could get the autistic kids to predict perfectly what was coming next, that you still wouldn't see a neural habituation response? And if that's the case, then how does that fit into this idea of reduced predictability? If it's just that even when they know something's coming, they're not showing a neural habituation to it. Yeah, I um, I think these, these are great ideas for um, future experiments and for um, and the idea of learning. It would be wonderful, right, if they could actually learn um, to predict something. So, um, I don't oh, future direction. I guess I'm not sure. So, do you think that the kids in the in the metronome study really don't know when the next beat is going to happen? Like they really can't, like they haven't detected the pattern? Or do you think that they've detected it, but just that the habituation response isn't there? Um, I really don't have any way of knowing. Um, it's just a, a passive listening task, so I guess we could you know, ask if they notice there's a pattern, but. Um. One, one thing you might, I don't know if Merdad or anybody from Merdad's <coughs> lab is here, but uh, Merdad Chasieri's lab has actually been doing a task that involves predictive timing. So you'll get a ready, 
set, and then they have to predict the you know make uh, mark the next uh, time point. So it's they're measuring. They do this both in humans and monkeys. Me how do you? What's the neural mechanism by which you measure a time interval and then reproduce it? So you know that lab is set up to do human psychophysics with that mm -hmm. specific task. So that might be something that so could related be related to that and related to your question. Uh, we've done some studies of entrainment, uh, entrainment to beeps and metronomic beeps. Uh, so if you look at neurotypical data, and these are data, you can get 100 people looking at this. Uh, so after about six or seven weeks, your lag uh, is almost zero. Mm -hmm. You are perfectly ingrained to the, to the beeps. If you look at this, uh, the same kind of data from ASDs, it's, there's always a positive lag. It's, it seems that they're constantly reacting rather than anticipating when the beep is going to be, even though it's a, it's a completely metronomic sequence. So that would argue that even for this highly predictable sequence, there is still a lack of, of anticipation. So, so how, uh, how does your data uh, uh, speak to the uh, some of the evidence in the literature that mismatching activity uh, responds to tone uh, changes in ASD actually is enhanced uh, compared to um, neurotypical children? They, they, are, they seem to be like hypersensitive to tone change, but those are oddball paradigms. So they, they seem to be able to predict what kind of uh, pitch uh, and tone is coming up in the next stimuli. Mm -hmm. And that's why they are showing bigger, uh, uh, they're, they're showing enhanced uh, response to the oddball that has different pitch. Mm -hmm. so. Good question. <laughs> Um, I think that when you have the cognitive testing put in place with it, you'll see a big difference. Um, just because we work with students and the spectrum is so huge, it's amazing. But a lot has to do with muscle tone, because a lot of them, well, you might see with eye tracking, they see that ball coming, but they don't have the muscle tone to be able to actually catch a ball. So they might actually see the ball and maybe even have the cognitive ability to know that it's coming, but not have the muscle tone to actually catch it. So I know there's some other factors that might be involved in there, but the cognitive testing with the theory of mind saying, oh, that ball is coming at me, you know, that's gonna be a factor that I think you'll see will relate to cognitive testing. So I think that would be super interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, plan to, to, to not just do ball catching, but to work on other kinds of tasks that yeah. would be less motor mm -hmm. but Well, these tests seem to involve learning. Uh, habituation is a very simple kind of learning. So impaired plasticity alone could explain, you know, lack of habituation or very slow habituation could be present. And I'm thinking of that comment earlier that there could be motivational differences. Well, what that will do is, if they're not motivated to play catch, they're not going to learn to catch a ball. I think little kids real early start to play catch. And early on, they don't show all these anticipatory movements. You show a, throw a ball at a kid too young, you'll hit him in the face, you know? So it takes a lot of practice. So my guess is that the, these kids are not motivated to play catch. I remember as a child, all the boys in my group could play catch. Only an occasional girl could, because they weren't as motivated to play it. I had a sister that got very interested in playing catch. She couldn't do it at all. So I spent a lot of time with her to teach her, and pretty soon she was catching the ball pretty well. So I just want to point out a lot of this could be explained by relative time speed of learning yeah. and perhaps a learning impairment mm -hmm. that you have to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though I admit it involves a kind of anticipation, but the anticipation involves learning. Yeah. I was just curious, did, did your son have DTT trial training, you know, that sort of learning? Did that work for him at an early age? I was just curious because it's yeah. sort of habituating a child to, you just do repeat the same thing over and over until that child learns that task. Yeah, he's so had, I just didn't know. He's had a bit of that. Um, he doesn't love it. And what? He doesn't really love it. No. no. So. Mm -hmm. 
I think the responses to simple metronomic beats, whether G uh, GSR or MEGS, a very simple thing that could easily be uh, explored in animal models of uh, mm -hmm. autism. And I wonder if anybody yeah. has attempted this in no, mouse models. to our knowledge. No. Yeah, I think that would be we, very, very easy thing to do, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. experience with these kids is I, I know that in physical therapy there's a lot of ball catching therapy <laughs> there I think that they're exposed to balls a lot and they're catching them um, just to comment on that yeah what do you can we be done <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you